All right, right y'all turn to Romans 6. We've been, I've been waiting a long time to get to this chapter. This is probably, uh, this is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And all the next three are three of the most important chapters in the Bible. Um, before we get started, though, I want to remind everybody, y'all, please continue to pray for Tim and Brittany. Um, they, they, they got, you know, a lot on them. Um, y'all continue to pray for Ronnie. I talked to Ronnie just a little while ago. He's, he's doing okay, but he, he said he knows y'all are praying for him. He appreciates it. And I ask y'all, please keep praying for him. Y'all pray for Don Hampton. Y'all pray for Maddie. Pray for uh, Yanni. You know, we got widows. But um, also, y'all remember, pray for Linda Schroeder. You know, Linda lost Dan just a couple months ago, and that's, you know, it's still a lot. I mean, Maddie's a little over a year, and she's still dealing with it, and, you know, it ain't easy. So, all right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we thank You for the privilege of being able to gather together and to study Your Word. Father, we ask that You open our hearts and minds tonight and just feed us with the truth. Show us the things that You would have us to know and help us apply them to our lives for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. All right, Romans 6. <clears throat> I'm going to read y'all something because it, it just always struck me and I liked it. Um, he, I've told y'all before, I'm a, a, a very big fan of Martin Lloyd-Jones. I just, I like his teaching, I like his style, his logic. He's, he's a really great, he's been dead a long time, but he's a really great teacher. But I'm just going to read y'all a story he put in the preface to, he, he's got a real super uh, commentary on Romans, but this is what he put in the preface to chapter 6, and I always like this. He said, One Sunday evening at the close of a service at Westminster Chapel, somewhere around 1943, a certain well-known preacher came into my vestry and said to me, When are you going to preach a series of expository sermons on the epistle to the Romans? I answered him immediately, When I have really and truly understood chapter 6. Now that's, you know, you think, whoa, you know, people say today, well, you mean you don't understand it? They've really never looked at it. I mean, when you really start looking at it, you're going to see there's a lot here. He says, like many others, I had struggled with this chapter for several years. He said, I had read not only the well-known commentaries, but also many sermons and addresses on it. None had satisfied me. Rather, they had left me with the feeling that they were all in trouble in some way. Some just skim lightly over the surface, using the chapter to prove their particular holiness theories. The more solid commentaries seem to be contradicting themselves and each other. In 1954, while preaching a series of sermons on spiritual depression and studying this chapter again, I suddenly felt that I had arrived at a satisfactory understanding, and I preached two sermons on Sunday morning, given what I now regard as the best exposition of the main argument of this chapter. Having done so, I felt I was now in a position to preach an extended series on the whole epistle, and I began to do so Friday nights, October 1955. He said, This volume is devoted entirely to the sixth chapter. The Apostle's argument is closely knit and is a vital, uh, vital that we should carry in our minds all he has already said as we approach the fresh point. The matter is highly controversial, very largely because of its great importance. My hope again is that these sermons and on and on and on. But I just wanted to read that to you all to show you that if someone with a great depth like Martin Lloyd-Jones years in his ministry went and said, I really don't feel like I've got it yet. So we're going to just do our best, but I don't expect any of us to come away from it, you know, experts. But it, it's the reason it's so hard today is honestly because we, we tend to don't, we don't believe we, we, that we have the power. We, we think we lack the ability to overcome sin in any way. Okay, and so anyway, we're going to deal with it. But before we do, let's kind of do a brief review. Now, we've been through five chapters. And if y'all remember, Paul started in chapter 1 up through verse 16. It's the introduction. And he just kind of tells us who he is and who he's writing to. Then immediately he states his theme. He said he wants to preach the gospel of Christ. And he tells us why. Two reasons. Number one, he said it's, he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not going to hide it. He's going to preach it because it is the power of God unto salvation. So, of course, you'd want to preach that, wouldn't you? But he said it's also the gospel, when rejected, tells us exactly what it is. It's the wrath of God. So he said he had two reasons to want to preach it. Number one, because the wrath of God abides on every human being from birth. 
Well, why wouldn't you want to tell them the good news? And so what he does, he does what any good preacher does when, he, when you've got someone new. He begins talking to them first, not about the good news, but about the bad news. Then he spends almost two chapters showing us that every single one of us are born dead in sin. I mean, have no hope. And he, he uses three different categories of people. He goes first to the pagans. I mean, the rottenest in the world. And he says, look, here's what they are, and every one of them are guilty, and I don't care whether they lived in the middle of South America. It doesn't matter. He said the very fact that God has shown all human beings inside that there is a God, and he said he also shows us by creation, but what did man do? He rejected that and he wanted to worship the creatures and all. So he said, the wrath of God abides on them. And someone might say, well, amen, they deserve it. And who would say that first? A Jew. And he said, but in chapter 2, hold on a second. You Jews think you're better? You think you're better because you have the law and you think you keep certain laws, but I got news for you. You're actually as bad as them and in many cases you're worse because you've got the law that tells you what to do and you don't do it. And then finally he, he sums it all up and says, even the ultra-religious Jew, the one that teaches the law, he said, you teach the law and yet you're guilty because you break the laws that you teach. So what has he basically proved? He says it. All the world is guilty before God. And then in 321, he changes and he says, but, and he starts preaching the gospel. And he starts preaching justification by faith alone. And then at the end of chapter 4, after using Abraham as an example, in chapter 5, he starts on the assurance of salvation. Now, why can we be sure if we trust Jesus Christ honestly and we, we you know, repent and we follow Christ and we, we say, okay, I'm justified by faith. What did he tell us? What's our assurance based on? Our ability to keep ourselves saved? The same one that saves us keeps us saved. And he's gone through that. And chapter 5 is all about assurance. Okay, now I say that because of this. Watch how chapter 6 begins. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, the, the normal way that people break up Romans, okay? I'll just put it over here. This is their normal way. They say it, it sounds real good and easy. Chapter 1 through 4, justification, okay? Then they say, chapter 5 through 8, sanctification. Then they say, 9 through 11, deals with Israel, what about the Jew then? And then 12 through 16 is application. Now just to make explain that a little, they say Paul spends the first four chapters telling us how a person saved. Then in chapter 5, he switches gears and says, okay, now that you're saved, you need to begin looking and, and going in for sanctity. In other words, you've got this behind you, now you need to get on to the next step. And the next step is sanctification, cleansing, being set apart daily, right? Then he deals with the Israel question and then how to apply the doctrines. Now that's how most people break down the book of Romans, right? I'm going to go ahead and do this. That is extremely misleading. And the reason is this. If I believe that in chapter 6 here, in chapter 5 and 6, he is starting something brand new and dealing with sanctification. I'm separating justification from sanctification in a way that's not natural according to Scripture. And it's what leads to so many controversies. If y'all have ever heard the phrase, Lordship Salvation. Now, I don't I think John MacArthur phrased that, but essentially what, what happened was there was a great debate Dispensational teaching generally says that a person can be saved, just saved, and yet there's no change, there's nothing. They're just a carnal Christian, they call it. And they say they're saved, they just haven't decided to go in for sanctification. They just haven't decided to take the next step. What does the Scripture teach? There ain't no such thing. Folks, there is no such thing. Christ said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? It would be like saying, well, this child is born but just hasn't decided whether it's going to grow or not. Is that how it works? Look, once a child is born, life has already begun. And what justification really is, is it's just the beginning of sanctification. Every person that is justified will be sanctified. If the person's not sanctified, they're not justified. I mean, that's just, you know, how he presents it. All right, so that's the common understanding. Now, 
When we come to our Bible, we've got to make sure that we never come to it with a presupposed idea. In other words, we come to it with our own scheme and then we try and make it fit our, our scheme of interpretation. In other words, if I came to it with this idea, then when we got to chapter 5 and in the beginning he says we have peace with God, what I would really be telling y'all is, y'all need to decide that it's time to have peace with God. You need to decide that it's time to get these things. You need to decide that just like you were in Adam, you need to be in Christ now. You said you're sa you see it would be a completely false idea. And we all know what happens when we come along with the wrong idea, don't we? Mm -hmm. Alright, the most important thing in Bible study, it's the context. You've got to know the context of anything you're reading. Look, every writer wrote, and before you ever get into what he's writing, remember, what is he concerned with? Why is he writing what he's writing? Because if we don't understand the big picture, guess what? We're not going to understand the details. Now, I'll give you an example. Haven't we all got a text? And we decide that the person that has sent the text is aggravated with us. And we look at the text and the words, we get concerned, we get worried. I've done this several times. And I say, oh, Lexi, I'm, I th I'm think I've offended. Uh-oh, uh I'm worried. And I, you know why? Because, number one, I can't hear their voice. I can't see their facial expression. I'm determining their mode of thinking, and I'm interpreting the text based on what I think they're thinking. Turns out they're just joking. Hadn't we all done that? Yeah, right? And, and so what we want to do, if we enter into chapter 6, and when Paul says, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If we enter into it thinking now he's dealing with sanctification, what we're going to believe chapter 6 is about is, if I don't want to be a low-level Christian, if I want to graduate to the next step, here's the things that I need to go do. And that ain't what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, here's what every real Christian will do. And so it, it's a big thing to, to keep it in the context, right? Now, um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you all another example. I wrote it down in the notes, but notice verse 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we were buried with Him in baptism into death, that like as uh, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now, the, the Baptist people, I'm not saying anything bad about Baptists, but a Baptist person will immediately, when you mention Romans 6, they'll say, Aha! Now there's the one that teaches immersion. You have got to go under the water because they say, buried with him in baptism, right? But let me ask you all again, what is the context? Has the context changed? What's Paul preaching? Let me put a timeline up here. Lexi, would you do me a favor? Would you get me a damp rag? All right, if I, if I just put us a timeline up here like this, and I say, okay, Paul has been showing us something. We're all born in Adam, right? Now, what do we know is true in Adam? Every person that's in Adam has already, if you can walk and talk, you already know something about yourself. What do you know? Thank you. You got a sin problem, right? We've all got it. And so, what I learn about Adam is, there's something wrong with me, and I can't do anything about it. I was born this way. I've told y'all I can remember being little and wondering if other people were like me. I just didn't get it. What was wrong with me? Well, later on, I found out what was wrong with me. Thank you, Lexi. What was wrong with me is I'm in Adam. And everything that it says is true in Adam since the fall, I find out it's true of me. Because Adam is my head. He represents me as the race. Therefore, everything that has been uh, put on Adam or comes from Adam, I got. But then I come over to the New Testament and I find out that a man who's saved is now in Christ. Now that doesn't mean that Adam in you is dead. It means you're no longer of Adam's race alone. You're no longer in the kingdom of Adam alone. What happens to everybody in Adam? They all die and go down. What happens to everybody in Christ? They all go up. Now, once you're in Christ, the things that are true of Christ have now been put to your account. And just like in Adam, look, it's a lot like a little kid. A little kid's born, and a little kid starts growing up. You know what the little kid's mom and dad are like, right? But the little kid is not like that. But what does the little kid begin to do? 
become more and more like him. See, he's already had Adam's nature imputed to him, accounted to him, and then practically he begins living that nature out every day. He becomes more and more like Adam right up until, just like Adam, he drops dead. But what happens in Christ? Just the opposite. The person now has a new nature. And the new nature has been placed in them like seed. And the new nature, regeneration, produces a new creature. But the new creature is living in the same vessel with the old. And so there the two are in there side by side. And the old is still powerful, but what begins to happen? Now the new begins to grow like Christ. A little bit. Nobody ever reaches sinless perfection. We're also contaminated. We don't. But there is going to be growth. Adam dies and Christ, we grow in grace. And so what Paul's basically telling us in chapter 6 is not, hey, you've been in Adam, now you've gotten saved. Now you need to go on and just start thinking about what you're going to do about your sin. That's not what he's saying at all. Okay, We'll get to exactly what he means in just a minute. But what the Baptist does with verse 3 is he says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? And immediately, what did they make baptism mean? Water baptism. Now, where in the context has that been? Nowhere. What is the context all through chapter 5? We were in Adam, but God has put us in in Christ. And for the previous 12 verses, he's been saying, what is now true of you in Christ. And how did we get to be in Christ? We were baptized into Christ, but that's not water. Water pictures something else. What he's, huh? It's the spiritual baptism. Look, the old word baptism, we think baptism water, but that's not what it means. It means identified. You have been identified. We have been placed by the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you what, we'll just read the verse. Go over one book to the right, 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, he's telling us the nature of the body of Christ, the church, the one true church, the, the spiritual invisible body of believers. In verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So the body of Christ is made up of a lot of members. How do we get to be members in this body? 13, For by one Spirit. Now it doesn't say with a Spirit or in a spirit. It says by one spirit. Then who's doing the work? The Holy Spirit. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, I've been water baptized. The Holy Spirit didn't do it. The preacher did it. Right? Now I'm going to prove it to you. He says, with this baptism, something changes. He said, we've all been baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. Now in Galatians, in Galatians he tells us, when we have been baptized into Christ, we're no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female, we're now all new creatures in Christ. All right, who's been water baptized? Did you go in the water a boy or a girl? Did you come out a boy or a girl? Did you go in a Jew or a Gentile? Did you come out one? Yes. Spiritually speaking, no. He's not talking about that. He's talking about when Christ saves us, He takes us out of Adam and puts us in Christ. Literally, Christ has a, a, a role. Okay, It's called the Book of Life. And it contains the citizens in His kingdom. And Adam has a role. God keeps a role over here. This is the, uh, I'm going to call it this world and we're told we had our citizenship in this world when you get saved when God saves you what does he do he takes you out of this book and he writes you down in this book in other words he takes you out of Adam and puts you in Christ and in uh, Romans chapter 6 what he's talking about is that he's saying look we have been put into Christ, we have been baptized into Christ. And when we are identified with Christ, what becomes ours? 
everything that's Christ. Now, what are some of the things that Christ did that's put to our account? Well, He died, right? He was crucified. That's how He died. Okay. He suffered. He was buried. And He rose again. Well, how does God now see the person that's in Christ? He died, crucified, suffered, buried, rose again. Your substitute did it for you, and God credits that to you. So when He says back over in Romans 6, verse 3, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized or identified into Jesus Christ were identified into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him. By what? By identification with Him. What's put to your account? His death. He says, like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see what he's telling us? If you have been taken out of Adam and put in Christ, then how do you begin to walk? Like you're in Christ. Okay? And it's not instant, but there's an instant change. It's tiny at first, but it'd be like a baby's born. And the first thing they do when a baby's born is they slap it, right? What are they wanting the baby to do? Cry. Cry. Literally, what are they wanting it to do? Breathe. Breathe on its own. The minute that child starts breathing on its own, there's life in that child. Child can't walk, can't talk, can't eat, can't do anything, but there's life in it in there. It's going to do all those things. So this is what he's talking about in chapter 6. Now, the reason he does this is important. Y'all go back to chapter 5 and watch how it ends. Now, what we want to determine is, in chapter 6 is Paul beginning a brand new section like everybody teaches. Now, y'all remember, there are no chapter and verses in the original. That come along over a thousand years later. And look, I'm thankful for them. They help us. But sometimes they foul up our thinking. We get to the end of 5 and then we read chapter 6. Well, Paul told us that he dictated this letter to his helper. I guarantee you Paul did not say, okay, stop, chapter 6. It's a letter. He goes right on with it. Now watch how it starts. Well, let's watch how 5 ends. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now think about that statement. You know, Paul does this all the time. This is his method. He states a thing. And then he begins to work it out. In other words, he states the thing and then he takes the parts and he begins to explain them. And as he explains them, he backs it up with Old Testament Scripture. He uses everyday comparisons. And when he gets done, he does something else generally. He thinks, okay, now what objections could this raise? And every time he'll say, okay, uh-huh, two things we need to say. You know, I'm going to beat them to the punch. And here's what he says then. And since a person says... Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now what that's going to lead someone to say is, well, if where sin abounds, grace abounds more, then if I sin more, I get more grace. Now, you know, that's what someone could say, couldn't they? And so Paul's going to answer that objection, but he's going to answer two objections. And look, literally the way it works out is like this. We come down to Romans 5. And in Romans 5.1, Paul begins dealing with the assurance of salvation, right? All the way through the chapter, he does that. And when he gets to 5.20 and 21, he makes two points. And the two points he makes really are going to raise two possible objections. The first one is, I can sin all I want. The second one is, what about the law? What good's the law? And so Paul is going to do like a parenthesis almost. Before he moves on to his next point, he's going to sandwich in Romans 6, where he deals with the first question. And then in Romans 7, he deals with the second question. Romans 6 is all going to be about what we call antinomianism. Now that means lawlessness. It means I'm saved, I can do whatever I want. Christ died for my sins, they're taken care of. Look, I was literally taught this when I got saved. I was taught your sins are destroyed and gone. Why even care about them? What does that lead us to do? Sin. Whatever we want to do. And look, I did. I thought, hallelujah, you can do whatever you want. But if you're saved, what happens? It's, it, God's going to get you straightened out here. And then in chapter 7, he's going to deal with 
the purpose of the law now. What purpose does the law serve? So 520 is exactly where he, he stops, where he goes into this thing, but when he gets done, he immediately comes back and picks right up where he was in chapter 8, verse 1. Now let me show you what I mean. Let's read the end of 5 and then we're going to skip to 8.1. He says, verse 20, Moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we've been through chapter 5 the last, I don't know, several months. And what's the thing he kept telling us in chapter 5? If you are justified by faith, you are eternally secure. Your salvation is certain. Just as sure as you're saved, you're going to end up glorified and perfect in Christ in heaven, right? Go to chapter 8.1 and tell me if it fits perfectly. In 8.1 he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Y'all see how he picks right up? Okay, look, in chapter 5, he's worked all the way down and said, if you have been taken out of Adam and put in Christ, you've got peace. You've got joy. You've got even in tribulation. Tribulation can't take our salvation. It just it may, it strengthens us, doesn't it? He said we've got certainty. We've got the Holy Ghost. We've got the love of God. We've got the proof that God loved us so much that He died for us when we were enemies. How much more is He going to keep us safe now that we are His? He goes down the list. He said you are can be just as sure that you've got everything that's in Christ as you knew you had everything that's in Adam. Now, after proving all that, what does he say? Therefore, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? All right, now we're going to back up and we're going to deal with these two parentheses in between. And if the Lord doesn't come back, maybe in the next few years we'll get through them, but we're going to deal with them, okay? <laughs> now, first thing is the objections, okay? Um... <sighs> Let's see. The first reason that we know that Paul is not starting a new subject in chapter 6, verse 1, is the words themselves. He says, what shall we say then? Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? He's picking up on what he's talking what about. What he's just said. He, you say, what shall we say then? What shall we say about what? About what I just said. In other words, I've said some things. Now, what do you say about that? Okay. So, what Paul says then arises directly from what he's just said. Does that make sense? How would you introduce a new subject, Will, with what shall we say then? You couldn't. Hey, the next thing is this. Um, the assurance and the certainty of salvation in Christ. He's told us, if we're justified, this is going to happen because we're in Christ. And he proves this, but he's got to answer these objections because the person that has heard the gospel, it's one of the certain ways you can know that you have given a clear presentation of the gospel. We're saved by faith alone. And someone will say, well, hold on then. What you're saying is then that we can do whatever we want. I, I've heard this many times. You know what you can, when, you, when someone says that to you, do you know what you can be sure of? You have presented the gospel. They've heard the gospel. No, I'm not telling you we can do whatever we want. What I'm telling you is whatever you do has nothing to do with your salvation. Hey, it, it's like the, ah, I'm trying to think how to put it. I think I might have put it in the notes. Hold on, let me check. Uh, no, of course not. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you. I don't even know why I make notes. Uh, well, I thought I did. All right, anyway, what he's saying is this. All right. Some people say uh, salvation is by works. Right? Ain't that what some people say? Okay. Some people say salvation is by faith plus works. Now, the pagan says salvation is by works. You've got to appease an angry God. You've got to do all these things. But most of, the, of Christendom says salvation is by faith plus works. Your faith plus your works save you. Folks, that's Roman Catholic doctrine. Rome will tell you, you've got to believe on Jesus Christ, but then you better also do them other sacraments or you can't get there. 
Okay, so that's, a, that's another way. Now there's another group that says salvation is by faith. Now, I'm not saying that's not true, but they say salvation is by faith and works doesn't enter into it. Hey, that's the dispensational. That's the antinomian. Hey, I'm saved. You know, I, um, all right, I heard a, a preacher telling a story the other day, and it's a good example. He said he was dealing with a young guy that had come, and he was talking to him about his sin. said the guy was selling drugs and uh, was in the middle of a divorce because he had gotten high on drugs and beat his wife up real bad and all, and, and said it was just this horrible list of things, and said the guy was listening to him. He said, son, you gotta, you know, you, you're going to have to decide here that you know, it's time for you to face these things. You're heading to hell. And he said, oh, no, I'm saved. I'm just a carnal Christian. Now, what he meant was, I've only gone in for the first part. I haven't gone in for the other sanctification yet. Okay? And this is a big thing that they teach now, a carnal Christian. All of us, to a certain degree, are still carnal. But what he meant was, salvation alone is enough for me. I don't want to fool with the rest of it. Right? No such truth, folks. There's a, a millions of people right now today trusting something like that, and they're going to be astonished when they stand before the Lord. They're not saved. What the truth is, is this, is faith equals salvation plus works. In other words, what does James say? He says the faith that saves also produces the works that come after it. It produces fruit. So that's the true doctrine. Now, whenever we start dealing with chapter 6, Paul again is going to be dealing with antinomianism, as I called it. And, and if y'all don't know what that means, anti, of course, means against, right? Nomos is, is Greek for law. It means against the law, but it doesn't mean, hey, that's against the law to do that. It means lawlessness, right? In other words, antinomianism, anti Nomianism is complete lawlessness. Now remember, we're not talking about the lost world. Who does antinomianism apply to? Saved people. Saved people that say, we're not under any kind of law. The law was for Moses and the Ten Commandments are gone. And when we talk about the law being nailed to the cross, they say all law is gone. And it doesn't matter what you do as long as you profess to be saved. Hadn't we all heard stuff like that? I was taught that. So now, antinomianism says, when it says, where sin abounds, grace does more abound. They say, well, don't you realize that the more we sin the more God's grace is, is made manifest. I mean, it's one thing for God to save a real nice person, but when He saves somebody like me, now that's showing His power. And people brag about that. Now, it takes the same grace to save every one of us. We're all sinners condemned, right? But what antinomianism does is it, it goes... <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way to put it. i tell you all what, let me show you an example. Go to Jude, right before Revelation. I'm going to put up here this too. Antinomianism always shows itself in one of two ways. Okay? The first way is legalism. The second way is lasciviousness. Lasciviousness means unbridled uh, uh, lust. Un not, and I don't mean like sexual. I mean unbridled, just you want it, get it, do it. it just do whatever you want, right? Now, the way it uh, comes is this. You preach the gospel, the gospel has been presented, and a legal-minded person, for instance, someone from Rome, will say, hold on a minute. What you're saying can't be true, because if what you're saying is true, then we can sin all we want. See, that's the legalist rejects the message. That's what they said to Martin Luther. Rome's accusation to Martin Luther, Martin Luther preached salvation by faith alone, and Rome said, stop. You preach this and people are going to have a license to sin. That was their concern, they said. Martin Luther's answer was, we've been sinning all our life, license or not. 
See, their concern was, if you don't scare people with the law and you don't have that hanging over them, then this is it. So they reject it, and they reject it based on your teaching antinomianism, right? But the other side is, the person that's dealing in a lustful way says, oh, okay, I can do whatever I want. Hey, look, I wasn't a legalist when I heard the gospel, and I got saved. I thought, finally, my sins are gone. I, I, it's weights off my back. I could, go, hey, I do some things I want to do. You see, it shows you your mindset. If a person says that the preaching of the gospel is promoting lawlessness, that person's a legalist, and what's really in their heart is self righteousness. They are saved by their good works. If the person says, like I did, hallelujah, we can do whatever we want, that person is still, the, the sin is still on the throne reigning, and they're still, the, in other words, ooh, good news, I can go do this. Like I heard, I, I bet you I've heard it 20 times in my life. Are well, you telling me I can rob a bank? Now, why do people always say that? They never say I can steal a car. It's always I can rob a bank. If what you're telling me is true, then I could rob a bank. You know all that tells you? That they've thought about robbing a bank. <laughs> I mean, haven't we all? Come on, every one of us has been in there and looked and seen all that money and thought. I, I've got a friend that just started thinking about how he could rob an armored car and come up with a great plan. But the point being is, why do we do that? Because it's in us. We think about it. What stops us from robbing a bank? We don't want to go to jail, right? So it just it, the reaction to the gospel in one of those two ways reveals this thing. But what Paul's going to deal with here is this. Now, uh, I've told you all about uh, George Whitfield lots of times. George Whitfield started preaching in England. They wouldn't allow him to preach in his church anymore. They threw him out, and he went outside and started preaching on a stump. The people inside, the preaching had been so dead and so lifeless in the Church of England. It was just formalism. And they didn't even require their preachers to be saved. I mean, it was a horrible. The people in the church heard him out there with the gospel and listened to what they, and they all started going outside. So what happened? The man got mad. People started getting saved, and more than that man got mad. The whole Church of England got mad, and guess what they laid the accusation against Whitfield? Antinomianism. If you tell these people salvation is free, they'll quit going to church, and who's going to hold the fear of God over their heads and keep them in line? Now, that's the idea. But what keeps the Christian in line, so to speak, after salvation? The fear of God? Yeah. The love of God. You want to please the one that died for you. Hey, so they made that accusation against them. Now, no one's ever accused Rome of antinomianism because they preach salvation by works. You're not going to get an accusation of that, okay? Now, um, let's see. All right, in Jude 4, we've got this. Verse 3, Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. All right, Jude sat down and decided he was going to write a letter, and it was going to be about uh, salvation. He was going to talk about salvation by grace. He's going to preach the gospel to them, right? He says this, It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now what he's saying is this, I sat down and in my heart I had it to write about salvation. But something has come to my mind and now I felt like I've got to switch gears. Okay? I'm now going to have to talk about something else. That you earnestly contend for the faith. Now what does he mean? Fight for the faith. Stick to the truth. Fight for it. Now why? What's come to his attention? Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. In where? In the church. Who are, were before of old ordained to this condemnation. People that don't like certain doctrines hate what that says, but it says they were ordained to this. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Y'all see what they were teaching? Christ died for our sins. We can do whatever we want. I mean, it, it, when you first hear the gospel, literally, I mean, that's very easy to misunderstand and hear, isn't it? And it doesn't mean that you're lost and you're not saved. It just means that if you've believed the gospel and you're saved, if you can continue in that vein of thought. I asked Tim today, I was just thinking about it, and I asked Tim, do you know anyone that's ever, an old man that ever has been died in his antinomianism? And Tim thought about it a long time. He said, no, I, I don't guess I do. Will God leave a saved person in that? Now, lots of people stay in it, but what do you learn about them? 
Not it's, it's not really faith, folks. Faith always has the works that go along with it. <clears throat> All right, so Jude's just an example. But y'all flip back to Romans 3. In Romans 3, we've got the same accusation laid against Paul. All right, Paul is talking about the fact that... Uh, Hey, he's telling us about our unrighteousness and how rotten we are. But he says in verse 5, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Now what he's saying is, if our unrighteousness magnifies the perfection of God, then it's a good thing. Is it? No, it ain't a good thing. How can sin be a good thing? He says, I speak as a man. In other words, only a fool would say that, some human. He says, God forbid. And it's interesting when Paul uses those words, it's not an exact translation. In other words, in the Greek text, it doesn't say God at all. What it really says is, let it never be. It's, a, it's like a double negative. It says, no, certainly not. But how did the translators of the King James decide to put it? God forbid. In other words, don't even think such a thing, right? He says, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? If our unrighteousness magnifies God's righteousness and it's a good thing, then God couldn't judge us. He'd be wrong to judge us if we said, yeah, but the more I sinned, the more better you looked. Y'all see his argument? Now watch what he says next, verse 7. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? See, the more I lie, the more we think about, oh, I'm such a liar, but God never lies. Oh, God is so wonderful. The more I lie, the more I see how wonderful He is. Y'all see, it's a foolish argument, isn't it? But watch verse 8. And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. What were they saying about Paul's preaching? He's an antinomian. Paul's out there saying, you can do whatever you want. Now, who do y'all think would lay that accusation against Paul back there? The Jews. The Jews would say, that man is teaching that we can do anything we want. Because what was Paul really teaching? Salvation is not by works. It's not by the law as the Jews taught. When Paul said, no, the law was to make you guilty. The law was nailed to the cross. What the Jew heard was the, the law was ridiculous, never served any purpose. Moses was a waste of time and you're telling me it's unneeded. That's not what Paul said. Paul said the law was necessary to convict us, didn't he? But what does the law do as far as saving us? It has no power to save. All the law can do is convict you. Only Christ can save us. So this is what he's trying to get across, right? <clears throat> now, um, let's see. <sighs> okay. Antinomianism is completely contrary to the purpose of God in redemption, right? Now what I mean is this. God saves us. What does God save us from? Sin. The bondage of sin. Paul's argument later on in the chapter, y'all flip over to 6 again. Romans 6. He, he, Romans 6 is divided into two sections, and we'll put it up here in a minute. And he, I, look, I don't want to bore y'all with mechanics. If y'all don't like it, y'all blame Maurice, because he told me he really likes the breaking things down. He's a nut like me, so I like to have things in their place where I can look at them, and it helps me. But Romans 6 is broken in half, 1 through 14, and then chapter 15, or verse 15 is something else. What then? He's going to ask the same question again. He's going to answer it with different, a different way. Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now watch his logic here. It's not Bible doctrine. It's just common sense. Things we know. He says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Now what he says is, whoever we serve, that's our master, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever heard of buying a slave and telling the slave, you continue serving the old master. Did Christ, if you're saved, did Christ redeem you? What did He say He redeemed us from? 
the bondage of sin, which leads to death, eternal death, right? You have been bought out from under the bondage of, of Adam, and that's the bondage of the devil. He's the king of this uh, world system. And you've been uh, swept out from under his system, paid for by blood, the blood of Christ, and now you have become the property of Jesus Christ. Anytime one man buys a slave, what's he buying for? You can come work for me. Now, what, would, what if the man said, no, I'm going to continue to work over here? That ain't how it works. Imagine a saved person saying, you bought me and paid for me and you'd like me to serve you, but I'm sorry, I'm serving over here. You know what that slave owner would say? He said, I'm going to give you a little while to think about it. I got some stuff I got to do. When I get back, have your stuff packed. When he gets back, if his stuff's not packed, what's going to happen? He gonna be a, there's going to be a beating and some pride. You're going this way, right? Now that slave, when he's first bought, if, if he recognizes he's been bought, he immediately goes with the other owner. There's an immediate change. He immediately goes. But y'all know, all he knows is his old way of life. That new master is going to have to begin teaching him, you're going to have to forget the old ways and learn to do things my way. Is that an immediate process? Yeah. It takes a lot to get that out, doesn't it? And it takes a lot to learn the new. Y'all remember when they came out of Egypt? He took them out in the wilderness, didn't he? And the old saying is, he took them out of Egypt in, a, in three days, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And that's how sanctification is. Okay, so this is what, again, Paul's dealing with. Now, um, uh, all right, in Matthew uh, 1, I'll just tell you all, quote, make the quote for you. We're told that Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins. Now, what does from mean? It's the old, the, the Greek word is if you see an exit sign, y'all know that ek, e, e, it's e, k in Greek. It means out from. We have been, Christ died and saved us so that He could keep, get us out from our sins, right? So a person is saved. Let me change colors here. All right, I got a person here. Here they are. This person is saved. The day this person is saved, they become the property of Jesus Christ. They have been saved from the wrath of God. They have been saved from the guilt of sin. Sin, one sin makes us guilty. And what's the wages of sin? Death. And what kind of death is it? It's a death that's eternal, the wrath of God. So that person has been saved from wrath, right? Yet that person is still full of sin, aren't we? So then something else begins to happen. This person begins on a track towards one day getting a new body, doesn't he? And when we get our new body in the resurrection, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. Will there be any sin remaining in the resurrection? Any sins in your thoughts? Nothing. But what happens in between? We begin to be saved from the pollution of sin. Another way people like to say it is the power of sin. Is that a one-time thing? No. That's, a, every that's an, minute, every, every minute, every second of the day. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Putting off the old and putting on the new. Okay? So, um, he, again, this is if, if it was antinomianism, if it was you can do whatever you want, that would go against the purpose of God. I mean, He, he saved us to save us from our sins. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Oh. Y'all let me... Get me a little water. I've got Lexi's homemade lasagna right here. I'm, piss, pick, I'm picking on her because it was Costco, but it was good. <clears throat> I'll say that because she likes to get something like that out. So I slaved over this all day, you know, put it out. <laughs> all right. Okay, Paul deals with these two things. And Paul is clear. He's very clear that he wants us to understand the verses, right? And what's the context? The assurance of salvation. Is he telling us that one of the things that can assure you of your salvation is you're free to sin all you want? Mm -hmm. Folks, that is not assurance. 
Hey, a person that says, look, there are people that say this. They say, if you ever talk to God about your sins, if you ever go to God and confess a sin, then you're not really saved because you don't believe Christ paid for your sins. Yes, I believe Christ paid for the guilt of my sin. That's been put to my account. But He also died to, to remove the power of sin. And when I sin, I feel guilty and I go to Him and I talk to Him about it like we're instructed to do in the Bible. I mean, y'all know we're so... I mean, all of us. If you think because we don't do certain things we're not sinful, what about the things we think about? Can y'all imagine? How would you like to have a court reporter sit down tomorrow morning and record every thought you have for 24 hours and then get up and read them in public? I hate that. Wouldn't it be horrible? Y'all know, I mean, y'all in the middle of praying, I will have thoughts come into my mind like, why in the world? Well, I'm a sinner. And that's also Satan comes. He attacks. It's called the fiery darts of the devil. So, all right, let's deal real quick before we, uh, before we stop here. Um, with uh, the actual division of the book. Uh, let me find me somewhere to do this. Actually, I've made a mess here, haven't I? My hand hurts from working on Gina's vanity. <laughs> look, look, Mark, I got my Fred. <laughs> The abuse just continues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Here's how the chapter actually breaks down. Look, next week we'll get in Lord willing and, and dealing with it verse by verse, okay? But for right now, let's get the big picture. All right. In Romans 6, 1 through 14. That's the first part. And what Paul does in the first part is he teaches against antinomianism doctrinally. Okay? And what I mean by doctrinally is he uses biblical doctrine, biblical logic to show this is not right. Antinomianism is wrong. Okay? That's his overall argument. But it breaks down like this. In 6, 1 and 2, he, we've got the question and the answer. What was the question? Do we get to sin all we want then so God's grace abounds? And what's the answer? God forbid. But Paul never leaves it at that. You know, wouldn't that be enough for us to just say no? No, he wants us to understand. So now he comes back and he does this. I'm going to step over again because here's the question and answer. In 6, 3 through 11, he gives us an exposition of the answer. In other words, he tells us no, but now he's going to go back and explain why he said no. You know, you tell a kid, don't do this, and what does every one of them say? Why? why? I hear that so often, I, I hear it constantly. And I hear the answer a lot of times. I'm in there studying and I hear, but why? Because I said so. Now that's, you know, <laughs> that's how we answer, but in all reality, you'd be better to explain, right? Uh, I know when a little kid, it doesn't always work because the explanations never end. Sienna can ask one question after another, after another, from here to Montgomery, and in a class, an hour, three hours back home, she can do it. I've never seen anything like it. Just, she finally realizes, are you a little overloaded with the questions? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, give me a break, right? But this is how he's doing it. Now, the last thing he does, in 6, 12 through 14, he exhorts us to apply it. Can we sin all we want that grace may abound? No. Here's why. And when he gets done explaining, he says, now, apply it to your life. I exhort you, apply it, right? Now he comes back in 6.15. I'm going to step back over. It's 15 through 23. And in 15 through 23, he's going to do the same thing, but he's going to answer this time uh, logically. And I don't mean scriptural is not logic. The first time he's going to answer with, with doctrine from the Bible why it's not true. The second time he's going to answer with just common sense. Now think he's talking to people in Rome, Jews and Gentiles. You go back to the Old Testament and prove something to the Jew and you convince them. But you've got a bunch of people, Gentiles, that have come out of paganism. So talk to them with common sense until they learn the scripture. Everybody understands the relationship of master and slave, don't we? So he does this now. All right, <clears throat> six, fifteen. The question is repeated. 
Same question, same answer, right? And then in 616, he uses a general principle from everyday life, and that is the relationship between a slave and the master. And in Rome, they knew that half the citizens in the Roman Empire were slaves, so they understood that. Then he's going to step over, or I'm going to step over, and do 17 through 18. He's going to take that principle about a slave, and he's going to apply it to Christianity. In other words, I would say this. I'm going to answer, can we just do whatever we want then? No, God forbid. When a master buys a slave, that slave doesn't get to do whatever he wants. The man owns him. You've now got to work for him. And to apply it in Christianity, I'd say, now Christ has bought us out from under the bondage of sin, not to continue serving sin, to begin serving Him. So He's just going to you know, make it a, a practical for him. All right, then in 619, He's going to do the same thing. He's going to exhort them to apply it. In other words, you understand this, put it into action. And then the last thing he's going to do in 20 through 23 is he's going to expound his logic. Let me, let's read it and you'll see what I mean. Look at 20. He says, for, that means because. I've just said this about the slave and the master, and it, it's certainly not being true of a Christian. You can't go and do what you want. Verse 20. Now here's as practical a reason as you'll ever get. For when you were the servants or the slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. How could anybody claim we were righteous when we're lost? We're not. He says 21. What fruit had you then in those things wherever you're now ashamed? In other words, he said, okay, you've been saved. Before you were saved, you did whatever you want, right? Yes. What fruit did it produce? Well, why would you think it would produce fruit after you're saved? If it was no good before you were saved, certainly it's no good after you're saved. He says, for the end of those things is death. In other words, everything that's got to do with sin leads in death and destruction. All right, he says 22. But now being made free from sin, set free from sin, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. He's saying this, essentially. When we're dead in sin, all our works lead to death. He said, but now we've been saved and every single work that we do in Him not only produces a reward, it produces an eternal reward. Of course we want to work in Christ. If I was willing to work for Satan for nothing, certainly I ought to be willing to work for Christ for reward, shouldn't I? So the last verse says, for the wages of sin is death. What does sin always pay in? Death. I don't care what it is you think about it. Uh, look, uh, eating, right? Oh, you can use any... We've all got so many vices, don't we? All right, I fight eating. I'm, I'm an eater, and I live to eat, as they say. And so what happens? Something seems like it's going to be good, right? Y'all know how we do. You're just going to sit down and watch a show, and you think, ooh, you start thinking what would taste good, don't you? Ice cream, there's my weakness. Ice cream tastes good the first time. Mm -hmm. But two hours later, laying in bed, it don't taste good the second time. But what happens? You pay for it. Folks, all sin. I'm not saying ice cream sin. I'm saying gluttony is sin. And you say, well, oh, here we go with Roman doctrine. No, I don't mean that. Everything that we do that's not for Christ is just a waste of time. I mean, just the TV show. I'm going to watch that TV show. What is that going to produce for me eternally? Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. But we all enjoy doing it, don't we? See, it's just the point he's making is, when you were, were Satan's slave, what was your payment? Death. Death. Misery and death. And even when you think you're having a good time. You know, I, I remember being a teenager. Come home and he, my friends brought me home one time. We had burglar bars on our house because we got robbed. And I couldn't get my key in the burglar bar. I was so drunk they rung the doorbell, Anthony Trosclair, and left me at the front door and took off running. And the last thing I saw, well, y'all know, but the last thing I saw was these fuzzy slippers of my mom's before I threw up all over them. Now, do you know what we talked about the next day? What a, what a good time we had. 
You know, when you're a teenager, you say that. It wasn't fun. The only thing that was fun is that you were rebelling. We rebel because the rebellious, you know, it's, it's fun, we think. Every single thing that since sin is, like the Bible says, it's good for a season. It gives us a little satisfaction, and then what happens? It's done and gone. But do you realize the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you so much as give a cold glass of water to a saint because they're a saint, you will not lose your reward. Folks, why on earth would Christ save us and, and have us continue serving Satan? He wouldn't. But don't we all find ourselves back under His uh, power sometimes? You can never become His property again. I once heard an old preacher explain it like this, and I thought it was a good way. Before we quit here. I've got two sets of 100 acres each. Here's the devil's property. Okay? And the man's working for this slave owner. He's horrible. He beats him. He treats him awful. He, everything he does, it's never enough. I mean, the man's life is just pure misery. The next thing you know, the man gets bought by the guy next door. I'm going to go ahead and put Christ. This guy is kind. He's loving. He supplies everything he needs. He even supplies beyond what he needs. He treats him with you know, care and love and tenderness. And yet, this guy, as soon as he's bought over here, he's moved from over here, and now he's working in this field, right? But you know what happens to him all the time? The old owner comes over to the fence and whispers through the fence at him. Now that's what happens to us. He whispers through the fence telling him, hey, you know. And folks, we all have this. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't need sanctifying. But the whole point being is, what is our desire? You know, it's easy to let someone talk about these things. And chapter 6 is going to be so important because it's very easy to, to think about my actual sins and then to begin to think, well, then I can't be saved. No. How do you feel about your sins? If you have the desire to serve Christ and to turn from sin sincerely, when we sin, we hate it, don't we? Yet we sin all the time. What we're talking about here is the person that sins without regard. And when their sin's confronted, they say, well, Christ died for it. John said that is a sure sign that that person is not saved. They have made a profession of faith, but they're not walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. One more time, Christ said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord? There's the profession, right? I believe on you. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? When you call someone Lord, that means owner, master. You're going to call me master and then go do anything you want to do? No. Okay? All right, y'all got any questions about that? I just want to do an introduction to that so we can kind of start dealing with it verse by verse and keep our context, okay? Yeah, let's mm -hmm. uh, my person start. He's saved. He, he knows he's saved. He's got peace. Yeah. And he can't stop what he's doing if he can go to God with it. Yeah. And, and admit it to him. That's something you talked about a long time ago. Yep. And over the life, I found that work. But when you don't go to God, then yep. you're still struggling with it. God, that Holy Spirit will help you through the yeah. Word by reading and studying and listening to it. It will. And going to God with it. We need it in yeah. every step. You absolutely right. And that's what chapter 6 is all about. He will give us the power to... to and you know, it's kind of like you think about a little kid. There is no way Sienna could come to me or Lexi and say, Look, I've been doing something that I don't like. And I know it's wrong. And I want to stop it, but I just don't know how. Do you think we're not going to give her help? Isn't that what you'd want to her to say? Yeah. But if she keeps doing it and you tell her don't do it, and she says, eh, what does that say? Rebellion. Total rebellion, lack of regard. That's the difference. So yeah, Wayne's right. When we can't overcome something, it, look, we can't overcome anything by ourselves. Acknowledge we can't go to the Lord and tell Him, hey, I've got to have help with this. Lord, I want to serve you, but I'm so weak, I don't know how. Like the man prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay? Yeah. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for the words of this book. Lord, we thank You for giving us Your Spirit that we might understand them. We thank You for building us up. We thank You for the growth that You've shown and that You show is available in Your Word. Lord, we know we're not yet as we ought to be, but we look back and we thank, thank You that we're not as we were. Father, please help us not only to believe You, but to put these things into practice, to let our light shine and serve Christ in a manner that is respectful and loving and showing of appreciation for what He's done for us, Lord. Let us never presume upon Your grace. In Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Amen.